So the topic today is just reopening, uh, reopening hospitality, so lodging or restaurants. Um, uh, and if other questions come up, you probably would answer that too. Um, thoughts on where we would start with that? And I turn this back to Amy or Deb. I think Amy was going to go first. So, yeah, so I'll jump in and give. Um, I know one hot topic of conversation um, currently is the governor's proposed um, economic stimulus package. So what I can do is give a high level overview of the chamber's stance on that so you can forecast what we're going to be talking about in the legislature. And then um, I am looking at the chat and if anyone has specific questions about lodging and restaurants, please feel free to ask them and I'll make sure I ask them to the best of my ability. Um, or I'll follow up with Carol. Um, but when I move into restaurants and lodging, I'll give some high level questions that a lot of folks have asked, but I'll start off talking about the governor's proposed package. Um, so something important to keep in mind on this is that the package is a proposal um, and that it does need to be approved by both the House and the Senate. Um, the Chamber's four-person lobbying team, uh, we're currently working with all the key legislators to make sure um, that changes are addressed so that it's a better fit for businesses or so that it's the best fit possible for businesses. Um, and while we do endorse the package, we diverge from the governor's requests in a few areas. Um, and really the changes that we're offering are to better help Vermont businesses. So the three main asks that we have currently is that the legislature act with a sense of urgency, you know, particularly with the grants um, and funding to go direct to businesses. Uh, we know how critical it is to get dollars in the door for folks. Um, also looking at the second bucket that's not the automatic grants, but making those more flexible for businesses. Um, and then third, we are asking for the marketing section to be adjusted to focus on attracting tourists in our drive markets when it's safe to do so. Um, so essentially we're asking for VDTM uh, to have the $5 million, but then also to acknowledge and work with regional partners, whether it's on special programs or events, but in particular, we're uh, asking for a change in the consumer um, stimulus portion of that because you know, we think it's going to be, it, it'll be too complicated and, you know, we might not get the bang for the buck that we're looking for. So we want to make sure that, you know, we put the marketing experts to work to drive visitors from out of state when appropriate to everyone's doors. Um, so that's really very, you know, we're starting the process. Betsy Bishop, our pre the president of the Vermont Chamber, she'll be testifying in House Commerce next week on this. So, uh, we are working behind the scenes and we're prepping for this. We've got our asks in order and Betsy will be testifying um, in front of committee next week on it. So um, if anyone on this call doesn't receive our state to Maine, you know, let Carol know and she can, you know, make sure we get you on our list. The state to Maine newsletter is where we put all of our weekly legislative updates. Um, so anything that's related to the governor's stimulus package will be updated on a weekly base on a weekly basis in that. Um, so with that high overview, I'm going to go into some of the, I guess, more popular questions that we're getting with reopening. Um, I'll start with lodging first and then I'll move into restaurants. Um, and you know, like, like I said, feel free to jump in the chat and write a question in there if there's something that I'm not addressing. So I'm here to make sure that I provide information that's useful for everybody. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the quarantine issue. Um, Currently, guests must complete their self-quarantine in Vermont before arriving at a lodging property. Um, so a good example would be, I'm traveling from New York and I stayed with my family in Ludlow for 14 days, and now I wanna go stay at a lodging property somewhere in Vermont. Um, something else that's a key component here is that all guests must complete a health questionnaire um, this could be completed by phone or it could be done electronically or email upon check-in. Um, 
but it is something that everyone does have to complete. And right now what I'm going to do, it's, they're calling it a certificate of compliance. I'm gonna copy and paste the link to the sample document that the state has put together and put that in the chat for you so that you have that for reference. Um, some operators have asked about what happens if a guest starts to exhibit symptoms um, after arrival. Um, if symptoms begin during a guest's stay, they must be asked to leave and return home if possible. Um, if their departure is not possible, guests must self-isolate for the remainder of their stay and the Vermont Department of Health must be contacted. Um, so that's where we get into the contact tracing. And um, so when in doubt, if there's you know someone that's symptomatic, you can ask them to leave. Guests are not, should not, if they're exhibiting signs, shouldn't even arrive at a property to check in. But um, you know, when in doubt, if someone's exhibiting symptoms, ask them to leave. Um, if they can't leave, contact the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and if someone, so that's, I guess, a key thing on the quarantine side. Um, are there any other questions from folks in the group about uh, quarantine at all? Does the quarantine just apply? The last I heard, and I didn't see the governor's update today, is it still where after June 15th, the quarantine is not in place, or have they extended the 14-day requirement past June 15th? So they're not necessarily going to lift the 14-day quarantine on June 15th, but June 15th is the next next big day for a roll of big announcements. So similar to when the executive order was in place until May 15th and they adjusted things as we approached, that's what you could anticipate as we move closer to June 15th. Um, there was an important update or an interesting update that came in the governor's uh, press conference today about overnight summer camps. Um, they're using this as a test case for future visitors to Vermont. So they're welcoming out-of-state campers to overnight camps, and they're giving them several quarantine options. One could be that they quarantine at home for 14 days prior to their arrival to Vermont. Two being that they complete a seven-day quarantine at home prior, prior to arriving in Vermont, and they must get a test, and then they must bring the results of their test with them um, so they can check into the camp. Um, the other would be that they could quarantine at the camp itself if they would be there for two weeks or longer. Um, so there's several updates there on how people can quarantine and you know you can anticipate what was outlined for summer camps if they feel that it is successful that's something that would be rolled out um, rolled out through other avenues as well. Um, I know the that a lot of chambers uh, throughout the state are starting to work. There's some movement, um, I believe Carol's on that as well, some movement on getting a letter on behalf of lodging properties to the administration. And one of the things that is addressed is uh, the quarantine issue. And what's outlined there um, is aligned with what has been um, what was proposed for summer camps today from the governor. Any, any thoughts on how they'll do the uh, social contact tracing if a person is, you know, from an out of state or is found to have, you know, symptoms afterwards or test has a positive test? So I would anticipate the um, contact tracing would be similar in all cases where they start with okay, Amy, you have tested positive, you know, who have you come into contact with within the last 14 days, no matter where it was, and then, you know, the contact tracers would go from there. So, you know, I would anticipate that that's how that will be handled. Yeah, I mean, one thought would be to basically almost keep all transactions to credit card transactions. If they're an out-of-stater and if you're an in-stater and want to pay with cash, you got to provide a driver's license. And that is um, one option actually for people that are checking into lodging properties. Um, you could require a driver's license upon check-in. So that's one thing there. And as you mentioned, cash, um, touch lists or car transactions are also generally preferred to cash transactions at this time too. Yeah. Yes, Carol? And so is the quarantine period, is it strictly 14 days or is it 
because I think there had been discussion about with test results, it was a seven day quarantine. Yep, you're absolutely correct. So with test results, it's a seven day quarantine. Um, the caveat is that there's, you know, it takes several days to get the results from the test. So you quarantine from, for seven days, you take the test, and then you get your results. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That quarantine still has to occur in Vermont? Correct. The quarantine still has to occur in Vermont. Are, are we anticipating that they will extend the June 15th date? Is that the feeling you're getting? So I think it's going to depend on all the health and safety data modeling that we're seeing. Uh, one thing that the Vermont Chamber is starting to push for is we're calling it um, an order of go um, so that there is an understanding of what the order of opening is what are the key metrics that the administration is looking at to determine what phase of reopening or when to lift a quarantine or when to increase occupancy um, so that there's a greater transparency and we can all follow along with the reopening process versus um, you know often waiting with bated breath to see who's going to be opening and what the regulations um, will be for that. So that is one thing and we're calling it an order of go that we're asking for because, you know, currently it's, you know, we're relying on health and safety data, but we don't, we're not sure what the metrics are that they're looking at to turn the spigot. Any more questions? I guess I, my concern that came up with his um, press conference today was about the about the fact that he said he wants to get all of the industries open to the same percentage and then move everybody forward at the same timing and um it it can go both ways i mean i think on the hospitality side obviously we would be an, a more potentially an at-risk um industry from people coming from out of state um but I mean, is there any thought or has there been any discussion about how to, to make this more advantageous rather than let's get the entire state open to 25% and then move the entire state to 50%? Yeah, we're certainly pushing for, um, for understanding, I guess, understanding the metrics behind the decisions and, and why is it 25% for the entire for everything before it moves to the next level. Um, I guess I had missed that that part in the press conference today, because um, that is a question is why, you know, so anyways, looking for that, similar to when people are, when the restart phases are outlined on ACCD's website, um, right now I'm gonna copy the link to the restaurant phases that are in there. So even having phases available for every sector uh, would be really helpful for folks so that they can plan because you know there's an understanding that people need to bring on staff you might be dealing with supply chain interruptions i know a couple of weeks ago i was on a call with other um, state restaurant associations and there's concerns over beef supply and you know being able to take that into consideration when folks are reopening or Maybe there will be disruption in linen services for lodging properties. So there's a lot for businesses to take into, into consideration. So, you know, we think it would be helpful for a longer, for the lead time and people can see the phases that'll be implemented. So there's, you know, there can be better planning or um, a streamlined planning for a business. Especially on the lodging side, because if we're looking at forward reservations and if we're looking, you know, even for the second half of June, if we already have, say, 25% of our occupancy on the books on a particular day, does that mean that I should be not taking any additional reservations on that day? Should I anticipate that the 25% is going to continue? And how do I plan, you know, into July and August and, and all of those dates um, to, to know, yeah, how to manage my inventory better? Yeah, well, I don't have an answer for that. On the inventory side, one thing like that you might want to consider is, and you, you could very likely be doing this already, is in your confirmation email, you know, stating what the current restrictions are for lodging properties 
as it's outlined so that people understand, yes, I'm making a reservation for an arrival on June 16th, but you know, I might, because of occupancy restrictions or quarantine restrictions, my reservation may be altered uh, based on mandates from, uh, from, from the government. I, uh, I think that'll scare people away, Amy. They're already skittish because of all the uh, <clears throat> FUD that's out there. If we add to it, um, my request for refunds is gonna keep going up. Mm -hmm. And then Amy, is there any thought process or any clarification? So I do vacation rentals, so we manage homes and condos. Um, and the biggest bulk of the requests we're getting this summer is for longer stays. And I'm talking more than 30 people wanting to book a place for the entire summer. Typically, historically, it's been seen as short term as 30 nights and less, 31 nights and more as long term. Are there any clarifications on the quarantine requirements for long term stays? So if someone, um, so when someone goes beyond the 30 days, and I do think that that's a trend that we're going to see throughout the industry is longer leases. Um, so when you're looking at that, the, a person can do a long-term lease on a unit and quarantine in that unit for 14 days. So that's how someone can complete their quarantine in Vermont. Um, so that's why you're seeing a lot of people doing long-term leases so that someone can book a stay for 30 plus days because then they enter into a lease agreement versus right. a more transactional agreement, like a, like a transactional process like you would with just a single or, you know, multi-night stay. <laughs> um, so I think that's something we'll see, but yeah, that is, um, that is a, a nuance there that if someone has a longer term lease that they're entering into, they can quarantine at that property. Like they can quarantine in that unit for, oh. for 14 days or get their test. Okay, that's helpful. I have a question. Just to clarify, that's how it stands today? Correct. So all of this is how it stands today. So I guess there are, I would certainly encourage folks to stay connected with Carol, the resources she has with what we have at the Vermont Chamber to just to stay looped into all the changes that are happening. Because um, if you think about it, the governor has a press conference three times a week. You know, there is often a little change at every single one of the press conferences. So there are a lot, there's a lot of fluidity to what's going on right now. Um, so it's, it's certainly, you know, paramount to stay connected and understand the updates. And, you know, that's why you have, you know, your chambers of commerce is to, to read through these things and, and boil them down to the, the nuts and bolts for you. So you know exactly what you need to and, you know, the key things for operating. Thank you. Looks like Denise has a question. Yeah. So we don't have a hotel on our property. We have a gentleman down the street and a, a couple of, that have their own hotels. But we have condos that people do Airbnb for. So if they're coming and renting, we don't, how do we know? I mean, do we ask them for their license when they come into the restaurant because they haven't been quarantining for? So restaurants are not required. So restaurants are not required to do the same certificate that a lodging property is required to do, but restaurants are required to take at a minimum the name and phone number of one person at each, in each party for contact tracing purposes. Um, you can be as detailed as you would like to be with, with what you're collecting. Um, so if you want someone to provide you their driver's license or whatever it is in order to take their their um, Restaurant reservation you can do that, but they um, you do need to collect at a minimum their name and phone number for contact tracing purposes um, and you know there is the you know, If you look at the foundation of how people are moving around Vermont um, you know, in theory, no one should be going to a restaurant unless they have completed a 14 day quarantine or they're a Vermonter that has no symptoms. Oh, 
Denise, you're muted. muted. Sorry about that. Just making sure that I just have all the notes for the boys when I get back. <laughs> Are there any other questions on um, anything in particular? Um, so I'll do some dive into just a little bit about restaurants. Um, so I'm being sensitive to the time because I think uh, Deb Deborah is going on in about five minutes or so, maybe a little less than that. Take your um, time, Amy. <laughs> so currently sure. for dining, we're in what they're calling phase 0.5, and that again is in the link that's on the in the chat if anyone's interested in reading along. Um, and that was effective the 22nd of May. Phase two, which is proposed, would resume, we would continue takeout service and on-premise um, on consumption, um, moving maximum occupancy to 50% of current fire, fire marshal levels um, and existing takeout and delivery operations continue. Um, so it's just, like it's a little bit of an increase every time. So you can expect to see that with other industries. Um, then in phase two, you're moving to takeout service on-premise consumption with lesser limitations. So every time it's a little bit less, that's going to be a um, little less restrictive. Do, do so, we know what the timing is for phase two, Amy? We don't know what the timing is for, for phase two. Um, and to one of the points that we've you know pushed in trying to get these, we would love to have all three of the Phase, like every industry is going to have a three phase plan. Um, we would love for even if they're the draft for those three phases to be public. So lodging, restaurant, retail, everybody can have an understanding of what one phase to the next is going to look like. Because um, I have heard some people say that, well, I'm not going to open my business because it doesn't make sense for me until we get to this phase, because this is when I know I can make it work for myself. So um, there are a lot of um, independent decisions that folks are making as they decide how they would like to operate with this. Amy, do you all have much input on what the, how the state sees, and I know it's really more of a federal, but uh, the enhanced unemployment benefits? Um, so, one thing, I guess that's one thing that we're looking at. I'm definitely not the expert on our team on the um, enhanced unemployment. Um, but, you know, there's obviously health and safety components that go on with that. But what I can do, uh, Matt, is have our government affairs director follow up with you on, on that if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, it's one of those things I think it needs to be stressed to some of the officials that, you know, what they're, what they have, they're really asking us to do is to be a bad employer. And here's what I mean by that. If you're saying to your employee, I can give you your job and I can pay your wage. And we're not talking minimum wage. We're not even talking close to it, but they still would make more on unemployment. You're, you're having employees that you're either forcing them, which makes you a bad employer in their eyes. Like you don't care for me. You're making me come back to work, which means long-term, as soon as they get the chance, they're probably going to leave you. So I know the government keeps saying, well, you know, they have to come back to work and if they don't, they'll lose their unemployment. Well, the only person that ends up being the bad guy in that scenario is me, the employer. And that's what they need to understand. They've really painted us into a bit of a, into a bit of a box where it's either you don't have your staff back because they want to stay on unemployment so they make more, or you make them come back if you need them, and then now you know, which now gets into PPP issues and other things. And they just need to understand that's the, that's the the, the pickle that they, we've put put ourselves into. And I know it was all done on the fly. I watched Peter Welch's, you know, um, town hall the other day. I wasn't able to attend. And I just think they need to understand that aspect of it as well. Yeah. And I do know that that was for the, at the federal level, we sent, um, we did send a letter to the congressional delegation as they moved into phase four. And I do know that that $600 kicker, we did ask for them to take a look at that and examine it because 
there are, to your point, there are many different parts of it where you're dealing with employee-employer relationships and how it interacts with PPP and health and safety. And there's just a lot of lot to look at with that. And I know that we did um, ask for that to be examined at the federal level. I liked um, this morning, I was looking over the video from the um, Peter Welch Town Hall. And of course, you guys were hosting it. Betsy was making the point to um, requesting that that kind of incentive align with the economic strategy that's going on, to have it be more an incentive for go getting back to work. So that was, uh, I thought, a really interesting point. Um, uh, that video, it seemed like it, it covered a lot of bases, talked about flexibility with the grant program, specifically PPP. Uh, as well. So lots of good information there. Is there a place we can access that video? Um, there is. And I do you have my email, Denise, or you give me yours and um, I'll, I'll get it to you. Anybody I also, else? I can also put it in the chat over here if that would be helpful. Excellent. Fabulous. Thank you, Emily. Also, just want to make what I know, like my daughter's work in Vermont and New York, and they're getting paid instead of waitress pay or bartender pay, they're getting paid $18 an hour. So and some, I, um, yeah, some, um, some businesses that took PPP or other enhancements have or idle, um, I believe they have used those funds to pay their workers more money. So when they come back, they can like get a larger stipend rather than, I mean, a larger pay rather than the $6 an hour. I, yeah, I believe so. And that's something that's done on a business, to my, to my knowledge, something that's done on a business to business basis for how they want to alter the compensation of their employees based on, you know, what we're the current climate. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at all? And I'll give you my email address too, in case something comes up when we're off this call or you can always get to me via Carol or I'm sure Carol has the answers too, um, but it's aspear at vtchamber.com. And I'm also, I typed that into the chat so everyone can, can have that or have easy access to it. But you know, never hesitate to reach out with any questions that you have or I'm sure Carol, Carol also is, she's tuned into everything, so. Hi, Hart. <laughs> so are we going to switch gears to the other expert, Deb Bugio? We can certainly do that. Hello, how is everyone? Does um, everybody know Deb Boudreau, first of all? Yeah, if do you, you don't know, know Deb Boudreau, <laughs> you ought to write her name down. <laughs> So just to know, just so that you know what our organization does, um, it's the Vermont Small Business Development Centers, and um, we do one-on-one -on -one confidential, no-cost business advising. Um, we've been here for the last 25 years. We'll be here through this, and we'll be here with you after. Um, my area right now has been, for the 10 years I've been here, has been um, Wyndham and Southern Windsor County. So Ludlow is one of my areas. Um, Carol and I have worked together a lot in the past. Um, we really are, it, and I don't know whether Carol is sharing the disaster lending sheets that I've been doing. Carol, have you been sharing those with everyone? We have, and sometimes there's a timing thing. So okay. if you've just sent out an e-news or a weekly communication, then we'll attach it okay. next time. So, so we try to. Um, if you don't have access to that, let Carol know and she'll make sure that you get it because that's, we've been taking the time to review all the federal and state programs from a funding standpoint, um, which is of course a lot of people's concerns now. And so that document is very um, dense right now. I think it's got, I don't even know how many pages it is, but we started out with Disaster Lending 101, and as you can tell, we just sent out 701 this week. That's how fluid and um, changeable these programs are. Um, I would, you know, concur with Amy that, you know, what, what is, what the governor's announcement was last week about the $400 million is a proposed idea, um, just like the CARES Act 
was the intention coming out of the um, out of DC. This is the intention, and just as you saw the CARES Act change and um, reconfigure as it went through, um, you know, the law writing and went to each of the particular agencies to do the deliverable. I think we're going to see changes um, through this program. We will certainly let anyone know on our list the second we know that it's open, but I think that you can expect it's going to be um, no one saying this quite out loud, but you know, it's going to be into June before any of that money is available. We did hear one thing this morning, and I'm preparing an email right now for my email list. And if you want to be on my email list, I'll put my email in the in the chat in a second. Is that this the Vermont Department of Taxes did say that if you do not have an online tax account, now would be the time to set one up. It is not going to be a requirement to get the money from the portion, the $150 million restart portion that's for lodging and restaurants and retail, but it will make the process simpler. So if you don't have an account, you should set one up um, just in anticipation, but that's a, that's a preparation step. It's not the actual application process. We don't even really know what that application process is going to be yet and i was talking to a lodging facility this morning and they were like well these people sent out this calculator so i could figure don't don't do those kinds of things because no one knows what the percentage of tax you know revenue that you've paid in is what is going to be the basis for this conversation so it's really hard and i you know we feel very badly for everyone that you know big announcements keep being or like patients, everyone, it's still not ready, but that's kind of the same situation. Um, we have created something I will put in the chat room. Um, I'm gonna try to do that right now. Um, this is um, what we call the COVID-19 recovery roadmap. Um, there's a, in that, it's about a third of the way down on that page, and it's an assessment of your business, where it was when you went into COVID, and then all of the things that you need to consider now, I've done a half hour walkthrough that you can watch. It's right above the first. There's, a, there's four flow charts. There's a master flow chart and three separate flow charts below it. Um, because look, just because the governor says you can, and you know, Amy hinted at this, doesn't mean you should. I mean, this is a business decision that you need to make based on whether going back, opening right now, is going to be the most valuable thing for you to do in terms of your long-term ability to maneuver through this knowing that this is going to be the effects of COVID are going to last well into 2021 so being able to pivot to streamline to be able to examine your business so we've given you a series of tools to do that and a way to walk through um, we believe um, one of the most important critical pieces is going to be about messaging all the things that Amy was just talking about around safety um, and having that very clear and and going conversation with your guests as they come back whether they're in your restaurant or they're in your lodging facility here's what we expect you to do here's what we're going to do um, making that all about safety because the elephant in the room for a very long time is going to be I could come there and get sick or I could bring sickness to you that's going to be the sort of general piece and so addressing that clearly and carefully I usually say to my clients you know watch what your online reviews are like obviously you need to deal with them one-on-one -on -one, but you don't really need to make a change in your business plan or your model until you start seeing a trend in those com you know comments if everybody's saying your check-in facilities could be, you know, process could be better, then you better take a look at that. But if one person says that, you guys know there's, there's always that person who has something to say. But I believe in COVID, you're gonna have to listen to every single person who has a concern about safety and you're gonna have to address it. Because I think the Restaurant Association did a really great job where they put, they put customers in three buckets 
They said the first bucket is going to be the early adapters. Um, it'll be interesting to see if those are all age related, where they're the millennials and the Gen Ys and Xs who, you know, don't really think much about this and haven't, it hasn't hit them as hard and they feel infallible still. Whether they're the early adapters, they think there's going to be a second group that are going to wait to watch people, watch businesses reopen, watch the spikes, see if there are hot spots, just, you know, sort of hold back and, and be a little bit more hesitant. And then there's going to be a third group that aren't going to come out until there's a vaccine, you know, are not going to move around their lives as freely as they did before without a vaccine. So the reality is the governor can open you up, but if the customers aren't there, it doesn't matter whether you're open or not. So Part of what we're asking you to do in this roadmap is to look at the cost of that new messaging, um, creating the plan. The ACCD site also has some great links to um, safety protocols that give you a place to start for each industry, um, training your staff, um, making it about your staff as much as you can. You know, these are the things that we're asking you to do as a guest, as a guest in our restaurant or our, in our hotel or you know motel whatever the facility is because our our employees are so important to us that we need them and their families to be safe you know so that it's about the safety of the people that are in your control and that then when you have a staff that feels incredibly safe you know this you know the best customer service people are your staff and when they're happy and content they're much better customer service conduits than they are when they're when they're unhappy and so also speaking to your staff a lot, using, you know, doing a lot more trainings, a lot more touch-ins. Um, it's not going to be just good enough to say you have to wear a mask and you have to wash your hands a couple of times a day. You're going to need to be much more aware of what those protocols look like. Um, so I think spending a lot of time on the messaging piece is going to be a really important thing. And then figuring out how you're going to push that message out, social media, what's going to be at your site. What kind of contact are you going to have email wise in terms of reservations back and forth? Um, and we did a session this morning on reopening restaurants. And I will send as soon as we post that online, we did it for a small group of people to record it this morning. Um, with two of our advisors have owned major restaurants in other parts of the country. And so they've been really on top of the restaurant business. And so that will be up probably on Monday. So we'll send you a link to that. It has a lot of great ideas in it, some um, pieces that I think that you can use. Um, let me see what else I would like to say. I know there's lots of questions about funding and the federal government funding, and it has been a very fascinating process. <laughs> if you can use the word fascinating with your tongue and your cheek at the same time um, and the PPP. So I can open up for questions on those things and tell you what I, what I know, because I am the person who writes the, the disaster lending sheets. And we do, we do, when we write those, we, we vet every line that we've written. We don't just add new stuff. We actually go through and make sure that everything that's in there is still correct. And then we do highlight what's new, from the previous one in yellow, so that if you don't have time to read the whole thing, at least you can skim it. Um, I also think the ACD CD is doing a great job with their red lettering, which you know implies here's what's the new stuff. So, because this changes all the time, and I think that businesses that are going to survive are going to be able to pivot continuously through this process through the end of the year again and into 2020. So. Um, we're here to help, Carol. I, again, I'm going to put my um, I'm going to put this in right now so that you have it. I have a really hard to spell last name, but um, let's make sure I've done it right. Um, and right now, I'm doing I'm I, I, as you can imagine, I have a lot of clients already, and we've had a lot more since we started. Um, so I'm doing half hour beginning calls just to see where you are and see what I can what I can do to help. Any questions? Nope. I can't hear Carol, so she's asking something, but I can't hear her. Okay, I'm here now. Um, okay. Would you happen to have the 701 handy? Um, I can certainly send it to you. I don't have it as a link, Carol, so um, 
you know what, if you don't have the 701 and you want it, shoot me an email um, at my email address and I will send it to you this afternoon. And tell me if you want to be on the list for that going forward, because again, we're going, we're going to, we're going to continue to update this. We'll do, we'll do 801 before the governor stuff comes out. If enough changes happen on the federal side, I know that um, EIDL program and the advanced portion of that has been very confusing. Certainly the PPP and my history of doing business advising has to be the most complicated and unwieldy program ever to hit anywhere. Um, you know, make sure your the, the loan application for forgiveness is out. There is a bill in front of the whichever house was it house that passed it yesterday. Um, it's HR seventy ten, I think, to try to make some changes to that. Um, it's not going to change. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to change the eight weeks in which you need to use it. Um, but it will change some of the. The Treasury Department loves these things called safe harbors, and one of the safe harbors was about the employee number portion, and they're trying to extend that so that you could, because the, you know, the ridiculousness of it was that if you can't have your full complement of employees now when you're not open, when the governor allows you, know, you to open at 25%, you're still not going to have your full complement of staff on. So they were trying to move the date that you could use this safe harbor out a little ways. And they were also trying to change the, um, the, the mix, the 75-25 that you've heard so much if you have a PPP, which is 75% for employees and 25% for allowable expenses to 60-40. And they were also trying to change the term for repayment of the unforgiven portion from um, two years to five years. Um, which would be really helpful because right now um, we know, I mean, everybody's pretty certain, talk to your bankers, talk to anybody that it's getting 100% forgiveness on the PPP is, you know, is going to be really, really difficult to do. And so there will be a balance that you owe. And right now that balance will come due. And even though it's 1%, it comes, it'll start coming in the fall. And the 1% is over 18 months because you've had your, it was a 24 month period, but the six months of deferral was within the 24 months, not after the 24 months ended. So in some cases, when I did the math with people, it was pretty startling, um, you know, just making a guess at what forgiveness might be. So um, there is still PPP money available. Um, I wish I felt confident in saying to any of my clients that I understood exactly how you should behave with a PPP in order to get 100% forgiveness. Um, and frankly, having read the 11 page application process for forgiveness now four times and a whole bunch of other documents that go with it, I still can't tell you that I understand it completely. Um, I think the banks are still waiting for further also for further um, information, there is a, the government loves to call the, I don't know if everybody's been reading these, but the government loves to call the um, instructions on these kinds of programs interim final reports. I think we're on the sixth or seventh interim final report on the PPP program. <laughs> so it's, a, it's pretty amusing that that's the name that they use, but there is another one. They've already said there's going to be another one coming out on PPP loan forgiveness because, again, they made it fairly complex. Um, so you can certainly talk to us, but it, we're going to suggest to everybody that they work through their banks to get to do that application um, for forgiveness. And again, to talk to their banks about the timing of that because of this safe harbor that they've put in. It's a, it's a horrible document, Deborah. I'm sitting here trying to figure it out now. I mean, uh, yeah. You got the nine pages of um, instructions and then 26 pages of instructions for the instructions. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and they've changed the rules. They've and changed they changed the rules. rules. They changed the rules pretty profoundly and, they, and they're gonna probably change them a little bit again. But I think that the key to the PPP program is still going to be the eight week period to use that money is probably not going to change. And that's the piece that everybody's been trying to get them to change through the whole time. But it seems that they're pretty um, set on not changing that because 
there was a bill that went in the the first bill that went in just recently they wanted to expand it to 24 weeks and the bill that we saw we saw hr 70 70 10 it doesn't have any extension on the usage of the program money that eight weeks piece is still in place um what has changed is that your base application was figured on your 2019 average number of full-time employees, FTEs, well, actually FTEs, and then an average month of payroll. And now that then they came in with the seasonal change that you seasonal businesses could pick a different period of time. But now when the application for forgiveness process comes out, they have, and it was a conglomerate. It was you didn't have to report by employee. You simply had to say, I had say, you know, five and a half FTEs. That was what you had to do. You submitted some documentation. Here was the amount of money that matched that. Now they've changed it to the forgiveness is figured employee by employee. Right. All of a sudden that's new. It's brand new. And the, they're calling the period from last year that you built the application on, they're calling that the reference period. The disbursement period is the eight weeks that you have to spend the money. And then the covered period, believe it or not, you have for the FTE side, you have three different choices. Um, and then for the compensation side, you have a, you have another date and those are not the same. They don't match up. So it's just, it's kind of ludicrous. So what we're saying is your best bet is to go back to the bank that gave you the loan. They certainly are getting, you know, they're not getting a massive amount of money for doing this, but they're getting, they're, they're being allowed money to do this program. They're going to be the final arbiter of what happens and what that forgiveness looks like. So I, I, um, I guess that's good. Cause at this point they're asking me what my opinion is on it. Cause they can't figure it out. Well, they can't figure it out because they feel like the guidance isn't fully there. Um, and frankly, it's not fully there. Um, I, you know, I've been reading these now federal documents for um, the beginning of this, and I was the advisor in this area in Irene, and so I had been through disaster lending before. And disaster lending in a discrete disaster like Irene was all federal. You know, this changed so profoundly because this disaster is everywhere. And it's not discreet, it's continuing. So the, you know, as we who went through Irene continue to say, the water's still rising. I mean, by Tuesday after Irene, we were able to at least stand in front of businesses and take pictures. We might not have been able to get into some of them, but we at least could start to begin to take steps. And in that case, everything goes through the federal government once a federally declared disaster, you know, a disaster is declared. In this case, all of those federal systems, which are really kind of small, frankly, the, the Office of, Dis of Disaster Assistance at the SBA is, I think it's only like 44 people. They normally can handle discrete disasters around the country directly through their setups. Well, they realized pretty early on that this was, they were gonna need the state's help. So first they went out to the state and said, went out to the SBAs on the state level who are, I was here again when Irene happened. Irene happened. We, um, Shumlin got the declaration. We got an order from the federal government that the SBA on the state level was to stand down and step aside. We're not SBA, but our partners there that we work with all the time were told to stand down and step aside. And then they deploy a federal team just exactly like the National Guard. They come in, they have their own computers, they rent an office space, they set up, and you're dealing with a team of people who are trained to go out to these various disasters. They have other day jobs, but they, they get deployed. They have to do a certain number of deployments a year, I think. And we started dealing with them, and everything went back through the feds, including DUA, which was the Disaster Unemployment Act, which is, which is what PUA is now, because they love to make us say silly things which is the pandemic unemployment, all of that, the EIDL, all of those processes went right back through the federal government. So they came out to the SBA on the state level this time and said, you need to help us. And, the, and they don't have any disaster lending training. They've never been through disasters before. So that every state is learning how to deal with disasters now. Then they went to the Vermont Department of Labor and said, you need to run the PUA program. 
at a time when the Vermont Department of Labor was dealing with astronomical numbers of unemployment on the regular side. So then they had to completely up, you know, upload an entirely new system, again, with not a lot of guidance. Um, and then they went to the local banks who were SBA lenders who lend in peacetime and are use the SBA mostly as a guarantee program and said, you're going to have to do this PPP program. So everybody's learning at the same time and under conditions where the federal government is frankly, um, and I love this country, so don't get me wrong, but is frankly giving a lot of mixed messages in these very complex reports that, and, and then they come up with an application process that's, you know, I mean, that could have been a simple process. It could have been if you had 10 employees and you can bring back five, then it, you're going to get 50% forgiven. Don't spend the rest and pay it back. But it, that was a pretty, that would have been a simple one line application process. And instead it is, it, it really is 11 pages. And it's what, what do you think it is, Tom? I'm an old design person. It's probably eight point type. I mean, it's like tiny, tiny, tiny. So you can read it without your, glasses. Yeah, go to your bank, um, persist with them. Don't worry about, they've got a certain time limit that they have to do it in. Um, but again, if this safe harbor gets extended, you're gonna to wanna to wait until the end of the safe harbor under certain conditions, because you're gonna to wanna to give yourself the time to see if you can get that full complement back, at least on the FTE side. The compensation side will be down here, but they're taking FTEs and figuring out a number and they're taking compensation. But I, I guess, Deborah, my problem with that is um, I've only got the eight weeks. So if I don't use it, I lose it. And, uh, oh no, you still have to use the money in the exact same period of time. So what we suggested to people, and if you're going to go do a PPP now because there's still money, why is there still money? Is because everybody figured out how complex it was. Look, the sweet spot for the PPP was for essential businesses whose employees had not been laid off, um, who didn't have to worry about pulling people back, who didn't have to worry about making an offer and now the employee refuses it. Now you've got to, in order for them to count, not to lower your forgiveness number, you have to report them to the state and you have to fill out that paperwork and you have to prove that you've done that. So you have to document all of that. And now your employee hates you forever, as Matthew was saying, because you reported them and their unemployment stopped and now they're making, now they don't have any unemployment at all. Um, so you can, you still have to use the money in the eight weeks. And yes, most of you are nowhere near. And I don't have, I have only my essential businesses have been at full complement of staff. I don't have anybody else. And I have a lot of clients right now who have not laid off staff. In that case, the PPP is just an unwieldy vehicle. So we suggested people create a separate account, put the PPP money in it, only spend what you could spend that was legitimately for em employees in that eight week period that started the second your money hit your account um, and, and, the, and the allowable expense portion of that, and then be ready to pay it back because there's no prepayment penalty. A lot of information, sorry, that it's a complex program. But if you, again, if you have questions, let me know and I'll try to answer them as best that I can. But you're gonna hear me say a lot, um, this is what we know at this moment. It's how Amy must feel and everybody else feels. This is what we know at this moment and it could change in a heartbeat and it does change in a heartbeat a lot, but. Yeah, the problem we have is what we know at this moment. Uh, speaking as a three-headed monster here, I do weddings, I do restaurant, and mm -hmm. I do hotels. Yeah, I'm not getting anybody back here for any one of the three right now. There's uh, the whole world is sitting on their shekels, counting them and holding on to them. Yep. Yeah. So the PPP is going to be a hard one for you to use in any effective way. When did you get it? I've had it for about uh, two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm spending it like a drunken sailor on everybody that I can, that I can pull mm -hmm. back and get to work. But um, I have innkeepers that are painting. I have uh, servers that are building fence. Uh, obviously, I can't wait on tables. I can't prepare food. I can't rent rooms. So right. I'm putting them to work, doing everything else, and hoping it qualifies. It, you know, they haven't, we haven't seen anything yet that says that they had to do the exact job that they did 
before. It's just that they have to be compensated in the same way. So. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. nobody's getting reductions because they can make yeah. more on unemployment than I pay them. Right. Yeah. Thank you for the information. You're welcome. Any other questions that I can help with? So I just, let's see if I'm unmuted. Denise, Denise I think had one. So what um, that gentleman just said, Tom, we, we have like, we have bartenders that our staff has been asked, can you come move some dirt around? Cause he has a CLD, TBL license and stuff. But then they're worried that their unemployment's gonna get taken away. So then they, do they barter to say, then you can pay me the same amount that you paid me, even though, so, so well, they, they can still work and get paid by, even though they're not coming back to F and B. So did you get a PPP? I do believe we have a PPP. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they should already be back at work if you've got a PPP, if you're trying to get towards as close as you can to 100% forgiveness. But again, it doesn't matter what they do. Well, um, a lot of employees that were on salary. So I think that's all where it mostly went to. Okay. Um, the Vermont Department of Labor is saying that people can work some. I'm not an unemployment specialist, so maybe Amy's person can help better on this. I don't know what the number of hours is that starts getting you out of the Vermont unemployment system. Um, Mike Harrington has said more than once that as long as you get a dollar from Vermont, you will get the $600 um, addition up until at least the 25th of June, July, when it stops now. Um, but I don't, I mean, that would be, a, before I had an employee come back and risk their unemployment, I would probably make sure that I talk to the Vermont Department of Labor, call the hotline, make sure you have a good book or, you know, knitting project or a glass of wine and um, stay on hold and ask the question of what's the limit of hours that one of my employees can work. Um, I can't bring them back full time, but what's the level at which I break their unemployment? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Carol, did you have one? So do you think there's reason for hope with the governor's uh, proposal, the grant based on taxes paid and any loans that'll come out of that? Um, that 150,000 is, you know, is all about grants. Um, we've heard, and Amy can correct if she's heard something new, um, their original intent was that it would be based off, it, and I think this will hold in some ways, because they're trying to find delivery systems for this money that don't log jam just one department of some place. So this $150 million coming out to lodging, restaurants, retail, based on your last three years of rooms and meals and sales tax, as some percentage of that number, um, based on at the beginning, they were saying there was, it was simply going to arrive. Now they're saying the newest language I've seen that went to the legislature. So we'll see what the legislature does with it is that there would be an application to the state, the Vermont department of taxes, and you would have to, you would have to prove need. I have no idea what that means. Um, certainly all of you have need, um, you know, unmet need. Um, and then a, that percentage will be done, whatever it is, and out will come that money. Um, that's why they're saying make sure that your um, online application, you know, online tax account is set up. That will just smooth the distribution of those funds. I mean, I think you take the number of lodgings and restaurants and uh, I mean, I don't, there are 77 small businesses in the state of Vermont. I don't know what percentage falls in this category, but I would bet you it's a fair number. So you take $150 million and you divide it by some number and you think this is how many businesses are, you know, this is how they're going to have to dispense this money. They said they were capping it before at $62,500. you would be having to pay a fair amount of room and meals tax to get 60, you know, some percentage equals 62.5. So I think at least knowing that that's the most anybody's going to get under the best of circumstances you can see that these amounts are not going to be, you know, I don't mean to be discouraging, but these amounts are not going to be massive. So, um, and then the loan portion, then it's about 
you know, our, our caution to, to clients all the time is be careful with some of these programs because they are debt. So you really need to do a debt assessment and figure out whether you can take on debt or not, because just having the money right now and not being able to satisfy the debt later is not the solution either. So um, the other program is divided into two parts. It's under a million dollars. We'll go to one bucket to apply. Um, the Senate, the, you know, the governor wanted the maximum loan amount there to be 20,000 and then some grant portion. Um, it, right now that stands again, as it went into the legislature, it standed that you, would, you had to do the loan application you could get the loan by itself, you could get the grant by itself, or you could get the grant and loan combo, depending on what you asked for. Um, don't know how much, how high the grant level was. I think it was capped at 25. Um, and then if you're above a million dollars, that's VITA, that's the Vermont Economic Development Authority. And I think those grants were up to $150,000. Um, again, we haven't seen what collateral is going to be required for those or what the, whether there's a grant portion for those as well. Um, so, you know, this is all is, you know, one of our advisors will say film at 11. I mean, because we really don't know yet. So I think in any case, what we tell our clients is somehow you got to dig deep and figure out how to pivot on your own and then whatever monies can come. Um, we've got to use them wisely. You've got to choose the right package at the right time. Certainly the state will work in concert with um, money that you may have gotten from the federal government. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're thinking the whole thing as clearly as you can through. And that's one of the reasons why we created this roadmap is a way to, um, is, is a way to, um, just consider all of these questions as you move forward. And look, this is a really unsettling and trying time. Um, and it's when you're worried about your loved ones and your own family, and you're worried about your employees, and you're worried about your business at the same time, also just be kind to yourself and do the best you can on a daily basis. You know, I say to my clients, if you wake up in the morning and the best you can do is a couple of small things, then do those. And then if you wake up the next day and there, and you can really dive into the roadmap, dive into the roadmap and, you know, spend the day in there and figure out how to use it. But, you know, be kind to yourself at this point in time too, because this is, this is going to, and it's a marathon for sure, not a sprint. So. Excellent. Where'd she go? I'm still here. Well, there you are. Okay, so things <laughs> moved. We down. moved around. Someone left their picture. So yay. So any any additional questions for Deb? How about for Amy? Amy, any closing remarks? Uh, no, I think that Deb captured it very well with what she just said there. Um, yeah, one day at a time. But if you have questions, concerns, anything that comes up. Really, please don't hesitate, and I'm speaking for you a little bit, Deb, but don't hesitate yep. to reach out to either. <laughs> exactly. We're here to help you and provide guidance and uh, hopefully clarify things when, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of information that's forever changing. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Yes, yeah, it is. Don't, don't feel badly about yourself if you wake up some mornings and think, I thought I knew that yesterday, and it isn't the same today, because it's probably true. Well, actually, a lot of the days are really the same. They're like Groundhog Day every day. It is Groundhog Day. I agree. I did attach the document that Deb um, referenced, the uh, disaster business. I forget what it's called, but we call it 701 or 801, 601. Uh, so right now it's 701. It's now attached in the chat, and it's a nice... Uh, Summary with specific detail on the uh, uh, the COVID financing programs, so you can see that. Um, number two, we uh, um, Amy referenced a lodging a letter that a draft letter that's uh, advocacy uh, for lodging, uh, and so we sent it out to members looking for comment. That was sent out today, so please add comment. Um, 
And I think that's about it, unless anybody else has closing remarks. And, and I would just add a really big thank you to Deb Boudreau and Amy Spear. It takes all of us. Uh, there's a lot of information going around. And uh, one way or the other, we can find an answer for you. Thank you, ladies, for joining in and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Weekend. -bye.